How you doing? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Uh, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 102 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and as usual, I'm gonna be here for almost a half an hour ranting away at you at things important to me that I think deserve your attention. If you have any reactions, by all means, let me know by email, hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And you can also go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and you can get the email address from there. Please uh, be sure to include in the subject line something like, you know, left side of the aisle, uh, your cable show, something like that, so I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient. I'm not the quickest person about answering my email. I do answer it. You will get an answer, but be a little patient. All right, with those traditional introductions out of the way, let's get to it. I got a whole bunch of good news stuff to tell you. So about the whole first half of the show is going to be some good, well, kind of good news, bad news, but still good news. Anyway, why don't I start? Because um, I always like to start with good news where I can. And I've talked before about the White House drone program, this targeted killing program, uh, and how the whole thing is so wrapped up in secrecy that it's hard to know just what's going on and how that's how President Hopi Changey likes it. Well, not so much anymore. About two weeks ago, a federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. ruled that the CIA which until now has been running the program on behalf of the White House, that the CIA can no longer uh, refuse to respond to Freedom of Information Act requests based on a claim that the program is secret. In January of 2010, over three years ago, the ACLU filed such a request asking, uh, quoting, when, where, and against whom drone strikes can be authorized and how and whether the U.S. ensures compliance with international law restricting extrajudicial killings. The CIA responded with the so-called Glomar response. It's a like neither confirm nor deny response. Basically, they were arguing that they can't even acknowledge if there is such a program because that would harm national security. Rather oddly, a district court judge agreed with that. And when the case was appealed, the White House continued to insist on that in court, even after Obama's nominee to head the CIA, John Brennan, spent hours in public testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee praising this program and describing how he would administer it as director of the CIA. But now the appeals court has overturned that lower court, taking the astonishingly reasonable real world attitude that the CIA cannot rationally deny the existence of a program that has been part of mainstream political debate. Uh, it's been part of Senate hearings, filibusters, and even comments from Obama himself. Now, I think this drone program, this drone program has killed, that we know of, it has killed over 4,000 people. That is nearly as many as American troops died in the Iraq war. And over 4,000 people in we don't know how many countries. I'm quoting the ACLU here. The public surely has a right to know who the government is killing and why and in which countries and on whose orders. At this point, now it will be harder for the amazing Mr. O, who actually wanted courts to have to act as if what everyone knew, no one knew. It's going to be a little bit harder for them to hide behind a veil of secrecy, at least on this. And that is good news. All right, here's some more good news, and it wouldn't surprise me if you hadn't heard about this one. On April 2nd, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly approved the first international treaty to regulate the arms trade, which is now estimated at $60 billion worldwide and growing rapidly. The vote was 154 to 3, with 23 abstentions. The treaty will go into effect 90 days after 50 countries ratify it. It prohibits the countries that ratify it from exporting conventional weapons if they would violate arms embargoes, if they would promote acts of genocide, if they would promote war crimes, or if you have good reason to think they'd be used against civilians or schools and hospitals. Also, exporters must evaluate whether or not uh, the, the weapons could be used by terrorists or organized crime, and they have to take steps to ensure that uh, the weapons do not get diverted to the black market. It covers a wide variety of military uh, equipment, from all the way from like things, tanks, 
artillery systems, aircraft, warships, uh, helicopters, down to missiles, missile launchers, and even down to uh, small arms and light arms. This comes as the result of more than 10 years of effort. And when this treaty was finally passed, it was finally enacted by the General Assembly, there were cheers in the Assembly Chamber when the, when the vote was posted. The only no votes came from Iran, North Korea, and Syria. The United States, which is the world's largest exporter, arms exporter, with about 30% of the world market, voted yes. Uh, Russia, which is the second largest arms exporter, with about 26% of the market, abstained. So did China, which, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, has replaced the United Kingdom as the world's fifth largest arms exporter. Uh, Germany and France, who are the third and, fourth, third and fourth largest arms exporters, voted yes. So did the United Kingdom. Uh, India, Indonesia, and many Arab countries abstained. Now, of course, what impact the treaty is going to have, well, that remains to be seen. A lot of good words and good intentions in history have uh, melted in the face of expediency. And this, this may prove to just be another case. A lot will depend on what countries ratify it and how strictly they enforce their obligations under it. Which brings up the question of, will it get ratified here? I don't really have to go into that, do I? Ratifying a treaty requires a two-thirds vote of the Senate. They can even get three-fifths to get ordinary legislation passed. Oh, and by the way, here's a surprise for you. This treaty only refers to international trade. It has no bearing on domestic law. It has no bearing on the Second Amendment. It in no way relates to gun sales or possession domestically. Despite that, the NRA and the gun manufacturers fought against it. As a result, in fact, of this, um, one of the amendments to that Senate budget agreement last month, senators ever eager to lick the boots of the nutsoid rabbit brains of America voted 50, 53 to 46 to say the U.S. should not join the treaty. In other words, the U.S. helped negotiate the thing, helped push the thing, voted for the thing, but in no way is going to ratify the thing. Because pleasing the nutsoid rabbit brains of America is more important than keeping missiles and guns out of the hands of terrorists and war criminals. So we have to celebrate this treaty for what it is. Uh, it's a first step, a small step, but it's a first step. It's a it's, it's, really, it's a declaration of principles in an area where most people don't have any. Uh, Anthony Kordsman of the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, referred to it as, quoting, a noble gesture that may over time acquire the kind of precedence or enforcement that would give it meaning. And after we have our celebration and why we have our, while we have our celebration about this small first step, we also need to ask ourselves how we morally justify being the world's largest dealer in death. All right, another bit of good news comes from GASP, the Supreme Court, which, double GASP, actually placed a limit on search powers of police. Just last week, in a 5-4 to four split, the court ruled the police cannot bring a drug-sniffing dog uh, onto a suspect's property to look for evidence without first getting a search warrant. It involved the case of a Florida man who was, who was arrested for marijuana trafficking after, uh, after police, acting on a tip, brought a drug-sniffing dog to his front door. The dog smelled weed, they got a warrant based on that, and the bus followed. The court held that the police had engaged in an illegal trespass and an unconstitutional warrantless search with the dog, so the conviction had to be tossed out. Now, one of the things interesting about this case is the 5-4 split. It's not what you'd expect. The majority consisted of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, no surprise so far, Clarence Thomas, and Antonin Scalia. The four dissenters were John Roberts, Anthony Kennedy, Sam Alito, and Stephen Breyer. Writing for the majority, Scalia said that the, a person has a Fourth Amendment right to be free from the government's gaze uh, inside their homes and in the areas surrounding it, which is known as the curtilage. 
Now, in a truly weird dissent, uh, Sam Alito said, if it's not a trespass for a mail carrier to come on your porch for a short period of time, then it's not a trespass for cops to do the same thing to gather evidence against the suspect. He then griped that according to the majority, the cop in this case committed a trespass because during his otherwise lawful visit, quote unquote, he was accompanied by a drug sniffing dog. Where, he wrote, is the authority evidencing such a rule? Maybe the Fourth Amendment? I assume you've heard of it. Now, the Supreme Court has, in previous cases, authorized the use of drug-sniffing dogs in a variety of uh, situations, including routine traffic stops. The difference for the majority here was that the place involved was a home, uh, a home uh, which was described by Elena Kagan in a concurring opinion as, quoting, the most private and inviolate, or so we expect, of all the places and things the Fourth Amendment protects. Now, as a footnote, by the way, to this whole thing, Kagan, in that same opinion, also referred to a drug-sniffing dog as, I'm quoting, a specialized device for discovering objects not in plain view or plain smell. This is a, a, an, an awareness that I really wish would penetrate the brains of the other members of the court. The dog is a device used to find things beyond the sight, smell, hearing, whatever, of the cops. It seems to me that that very basis makes the use of a drug-sniffing dog without a warrant unconstitutional, an unconstitutional search. That is, unless we want to argue that our Fourth Amendment protections only extend so far as our most advanced devices or technology will not reach. All right, one last thing. Uh, while we're on the topic of good news, one last thing I want to get to. Uh, there's more good news in the area where there seems to be a lot of good news of late, same-sex marriage. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the oral arguments before the Supreme Court. I'm sure you heard about it, uh, except to note that uh, there's a, um, a lot of the observers of the court think that based on oral arguments, they figure that the proponents of marriage equality are probably going to succeed to win by a five to four vote on both those counts because classic swing vote uh, Anthony Kennedy seems to be leading in that direction. But it's also true that predicting the outcome of Supreme Court decisions based on oral arguments is far from an exact science. And it's best not to get our hopes up, but instead to wait for the actual decision, which is uh, decisions are expected in June. I did, however, before I leave that, that, I wanted to mention one argument that Sam Alito made. It really struck me as jaw-dropping. I'm beginning to think that between his dissent in the other case and his comment and oral argument here, that Sam's getting a little loopy. Uh, quoting him, you want us to step in and render a decision based on an assessment of the effects of this institution, which is newer than cell phones or the Internet. On a question like that of such fundamental importance, why should it not be left for the people, either acting through initiatives and referendums or through their elected public officials? Well, first, Sammy, because human rights are not a popularity contest and they do not stand or fall based on majority opinion. Second, the institution at issue here is marriage, which is rather older than cell phones or the internet. And the issue at hand is whether or not same-sex couples can be denied access to that institution. It's not a case of this is marriage and this is same-sex marriage. And the fact that you apparently think of it that way and apparently prepared to treat it that way indicates to me a, a great lack of knowledge or a great presence of bigotry and maybe both. All right, but getting away from, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Roberts and the Supremes for a moment, there is some good news on the area of same-sex marriage. For example, Senator Mark Kirk has become the second Republican senator to support recognizing same-sex marriage. He is now the 50th member of the United States Senate to do so. Uh, and it also appears that Senator Lisa Murkowski is likely fairly soon to follow him and become the third Republican to do so. And here's some news for you. Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly, who previously had said at various times that same-sex marriage would lead to people marrying a turtle, a goat, a duck, or a dolphin, said last week that he doesn't feel strongly about the issue one way or the other, and actually said that the compelling argument is on the side of marriage equality proponents, and all that the opponents had been able to do was thump the Bible, 
which he said is not a proper basis for public policy. Hey, if they lost Bill O'Reilly, you know. Um, one person they haven't lost, however, is Alan Keyes, former diplomat, perennial candidate, and all-around flake, who argued the other day that gay marriage is, quoting him, the archetype of all crimes against humanity. <laughs> yeah, worse than racism, worse than slavery, worse than war crimes, worse than war, worse than genocide. Same-sex marriage is the archetype of all crimes against humanity. In fact, he said, if you do not oppose same-sex marriage, quoting, you are abandoning your obligation as a human being. Now, it's unclear if by that he meant that gays and lesbians are obligated as human beings to say that they can't get married, or whether he meant gays and lesbians are not human beings. I, in his case, either one of those is entirely possible. But I'm going to end this with one more quote. This is from a man named Calvin Butts. He's a pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And he said this this past Sunday in relation to same-sex marriage, quoting, It's something we don't believe in, in terms of what we have learned from the Bible. But in terms of men and women having their rights as citizens and human beings, we certainly can affirm that. You should have every right as a citizen of this nation and every right as a human being to enjoy the freedom that God has given you. That choice is yours, and I should not stand in the way of you making that choice. My question for all of the wing nuts and Bible thumpers out there is, what is so hard to understand about that? We're going to take a break. We're back. Hi there. Um, we're going to right, slide right over now into uh, one of our regular features, the Clown Award, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. And um, this case is good because it does refer to, back to same-sex marriage, to somebody else the Bible thumpers have not lost. Her name is Sue Everhart, and she is the chair of the Republican Party of Georgia. Late last week, Ms. Everhart said in an interview that straight people might enter into bogus of gay marriages in order to obtain benefits. Suppose she said, you're straight, you have a job with great benefits, you got another friend who's straight. What, she said, would prohibit you from saying that you're gay and you all get married and still live as separate, but you get all the benefits. I just see so much abuse in this, it's unreal. There's no way this is about equality. To me, it's all about a free ride. Now, it's true that, hypothetically, such an arrangement could happen, but it's also true the same thing could happen with a man and a woman for the same reason. Um, but then the thing is, there's no evidence of fraud of, any, of that sort anyway. But the real reason she's our winner this week, the real reason she gets the big red nose, in that same interview, demonstrating her remarkable intellect, her wide-ranging worldly knowledge, Everhart also said that she could not understand how gay people could ever have sex. If it was natural, he sa she said, they would have the equipment to have a sexual relationship. Ms. Everhart, get out of the house on occasion, okay? Read a book. Ask your kids, I bet they can explain it to you. Just what a clown. All right, from the ridiculous to the outrageous. Our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. I had a hard time choosing this week because there's something I really wanted to talk about, but it was about, um, in fact, I may still talk about this sometime in the future. I want to talk about CVS. CVS is telling its, its employees, excuse me, its colleagues, because you know we're all equal here, telling its underlings, to go to the doctor, have the doctor determine their height, weight, body fat, blood pressure, and other personal medical data, then to allow that personal data to go not only to the insurance company, but also to another company that's managing benefits on behalf of CVS. In other words, gather all this data and be willing to have it spread even further. Uh, workers who don't take part in this voluntary wellness review will have to pay an annual $600 penalty. Paraphrasing Arthur Dent, this is obviously some meaning of the word voluntary, of which I was previously unaware. I think what really got me about this, beyond the nonsense about colleagues and voluntary, is that the company brazenly lied about this policy. Just, uh, they claimed it's common, that this is common. 
In fact, a corporate flunky referred to a study that said 80% of large companies um, offered a health assessment as part of their insurance coverage, and three quarters of those offer positive incentives for those to take part. The thing is, a Kaiser study, Kaiser Institute study, found that it's true, a lot of companies, especially large ones, offer uh, wellness reviews as part of their insurance coverage, but only 18% of them actually told their employees to go get one, and only half of those, or 9%, penalized anybody that didn't. 9% is not common. CVS lied. Uh, I'll probably uh, I want to talk about this more in the future because of its relation to issues of personal privacy and, uh, and its relations to Obamacare, and yes, there is one. But the real outrage of the week, this week, Walmart, Walmart has sued a grocery workers union and others, including individuals, who have protested at its Florida stores. That is, Walmart is suing them for protesting the corporation's underpaying, cheating, and exploiting its employees. That, the company said, is trespassing. And it must, it just must, it said, protect our customers and associates from further disruptive tactics associated with their continued illegal trespassing. Walmart does not have any union representation in its U.S. stores. It, has, it is and has been throughout its history one of the most notoriously and bitterly anti-union companies in the country. It has a corporate policy of trying to pay people as little as possible, and none of you should shop there until it changes. What it's trying to do now is force the threat of legal action, to use the threat of legal action, to force its opponents to just shut up and go away. Those critics include the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, a group of present and former Walmart workers called Our Walmart, and uh, Central Florida Jobs with Justice, plus some individuals associated with those groups. This has nothing to do with protecting customers. It has less than nothing to do with protecting employees. The only thing they're interested in protecting is corporate profits, period. Among the horrendous deeds of which the protesters are accused in the suit are projecting a video on the side of a store, entering a store to confront a manager, using bullhorns, and, I swear I'm not making this up, carrying signs on sticks. This suit seems to me to be a variation of what came to be known as SLAPS, S-L-A-P-P, -P, Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. They are described as lawsuits intended to censor, intimidate, and silence critics by burdening them with the cost of legal defense until they, they, they exhaust their resources. That is, the sewers, in this case Walmart, don't expect to win the suit. What they want to do is drain their opponents financially or emotionally, or better yet, both, until they just give up and surrender. They were popular among corporations in the 70s into the 90s, particularly when they were leveled against individuals or groups known as kitchen table groups uh, that were using things like regulatory procedures and hearings to oppose some plan of some corporation. The price for dropping these suits, and remember, these, these were basically, they were patently frivolous suits because in essence they would argue that by criticizing the corporation's plan, you were by definition defaming the company. They're patently frivolous, but the price for, for dropping the suit usually was dropping out of the regulatory process and letting the corporation proceed unopposed. These suits actually lost a lot of their luster when some people who were in a position to actually fight the suit started fighting them, of course winning, and then instituted what became known as slapbacks, where the positions are reversed and instead of being the plaintiff, the corporation is now the defendant. But still, they do continue to happen. And this is not a typical example, uh, frankly, because at least so far, uh, Walmart's not demanding damages from the group, but uh, it does seem to me that it has the same goal. Its purpose is to force their opponents to just shut up and go away. And something I kept wondering why the suit was filed in Florida. I mean, Walmart stores across the country were targeted by these same groups by the same union. So why Florida? I mean, are the laws better? Do you think the courts are more sympathetic? I mean, truth is, I don't know. What I do know is this. Don't shop at Walmart. 
All right, I'm going to wrap up here with a couple of very quick updates. Uh, first, a couple of weeks ago, I gave Google a hero award. Now, I know Google's been evil in a lot of ways, but I gave them a hero award for being the first technology company to report on the number of requests it had received from law enforcement to provide information about their customers. Now, both Twitter and Microsoft have followed with their first of what Microsoft is calling uh, transparency reports. Microsoft says it will update its report every six months. Hopefully, other countries will follow, uh, companies rather, will follow suit on this path being laid out so that people can start to understand just how widespread and pervasive these kind of requests really are. Second thing, I have talked several times about the Keystone XL pipeline, the one to carry that, what if it's completed, carry these really polluting, damaging tar sands from Canada down to the Texas coast to be refined and then exported. The State Department was involved in this process because the pipeline crosses an international border. So it had to approve and it recently green-lighted the project saying the environmental impact would be minor. It turns out that the uh, report's authors were outside contractors with ties to the oil industry. And in fact, the one that produced the bulk of the report, which is called Environmental Resources Management, has ties to tar sands extraction companies. What's more, in 2002, that same outfit, Environmental Resources Management, declared that the then proposed BP Caspian pipeline was environmentally and economically sound. The same thing they've just said about the Keystone XL pipeline. And that earlier pipeline not only failed to produce the jobs that were claimed, but it's been the site of oil spills and explosions. It's time to drop the, f drop the farce about and the hammer on the Keystone XL Pipeline. All right, that's going to be it for this week. There's a bunch of stuff I really want to talk about next week, that, um, some serious stuff that I didn't have time for. Uh, CISPA, you may remember CISPA, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, that one that threatened Internet uh, privacy. That's back. And the uh, Consumer Fraud, Computer rather, Fraud and Abuse Act is being expanded and interpreted uh, it was originally set up to, to go after hackers who like broke into banks and steal credit card information, but it's been expanded so broadly that literally now, if you violate the terms of service of a website, you could be charged with a felony. And no, I am not exaggerating. Uh, and also, I got to get back to talking about the economy. And finally, next week, we have to talk more about guns. There's some good news about gun legislation. There's some bad news about gun legislation. But we've got to get back to talking about guns. This is not something we can just let slip away. Uh, we need to understand what's going on. So that's it. I'm going to wrap up there. And um, you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Happy spring. Don't forget to email me.